fantastic to be um, talking to you all today. Um, today we are joined by um, Professor Nigel Saul, who's going to be talking to us about Decorated in Glory, church building in Herefordshire in the 14th century. Um, I see already there's been some really wonderful comments coming in. But if you're joining us for the first time today, please do say hello. Let us know where you're watching from. But also, if you see any spam links being posted, please do not click them. Our lectures are always free of charge. Um, there's no paywall, and you can only watch them live at the moment on our Facebook page. Um, so don't click any links. If you've got any questions or problems, just send us a message or comment, and we'll be on hand to help. But I'm going to pass you over to our chief executive, Peter Ayres, who's going to tell you about our Church of the week. So over to you, Peter. Thank you very much, George. And hello, everybody, and welcome to our lecture. Now, this week's Church of the Week, you're lucky. You, If you're here already, you might get to see this twice because it's, I believe, included in our lecture today as well. Uh, but we couldn't resist uh, showing you this church today because it is an absolute corker. I'm just going to share my screen for you so you can see some pictures of this. And um, before we start, I'd just like to say a huge thank you to Ecclesiastical who sponsor this lecture series uh, and we're very grateful for their for their support. Right, just see if I can get this into full screen mode. There we go. So uh, the Church of St Bartholomew's Richard Castle is in Herefordshire and it really is a gem. This 12th century church is perched high above the village next to one of the earliest marcher castles built by the Norman overlords to defend the Anglo-Welsh border. This 12th century church, sorry, I've, I've given you the wrong, wrong thing there, the wrong slide. That was slide two, I'm afraid. So I'll go to slide three. As with many churches in our care, this church has, has had such a long and fascinating history spanning nearly a thousand years. We often think about castles and grand cathedrals, which are this old, but parish churches of this age are incredibly precious and important also because of these, because these are the buildings that actually were used by everybody every day for centuries. And they have so many wonderful community tales and traditions attached to them. And I always say they're the most democratic of historic buildings because they tell a story of absolutely everybody from the richest to the poorest. And they were very much part of daily life. On this slide, uh, you'll see that St Bartholomew, on the next slide, sorry, you'll see that St Bartholomew has a detached tower. But I want to draw your attention to the chancel and the south aisle. The south aisle was added in the early 14th century to house a chantry a chapel to pray for the souls of the departed. In around 1350, the chancel was rebuilt and enlarged. You can see the entrance to the, you can see the entrance into the crypt. Sadly, you can see the, I can't point to it, but you can see that it's there. Sadly, at the time of the Reformation, this was bricked up and filled in and used for burials. The Victorians then restored the chancel floor level, but destroyed the crypt ceiling. The chamber has since been excavated but there is no visitor access to it. Here's the, here's the detached bell tower uh, which dates to the 14th century and may possibly have been part of the castle's defences as well. Looks quite defensive. Here's the very grand interior looking down the nave complete with a course of Georgian pew box or box pews as you can see here and there's a better shot of them just here. So we're now inside the North Chapel, and here is the 17th century canopied pew. Oh, there we go. Uh, in the canopied pew for the Solways, Lords of the Manor, who still use it at two or three services held each year here. Now, originally, this chapel had a rather exciting purpose. The chapel was built to serve as a chantry chapel for the local chapter of the Knights Templar. We actually have a few churches in our, in our care which have Templar connections, and we'll no doubt cover these in some future churches of the week. Finally, here you can see some treasures that normally people who visit our churches might not spot. The font is 12th century. Just think how many people might have been baptised using it. And behind it, attached to the wall, is a 13th century carved coffin lid. Below the west window is a Georgian gallery composed of tiered benches reached by an oak stair erected for church choir or musicians. What a fantastic church. It is absolutely brilliant. And there was just one thing I, what I left out in my description, because the family of the people who built this, because it's called Richard's Castle. Uh, and as you imagine, the, the castle is named after someone called Richard. And it was actually Richard Fitz Scroob. And it's such a great name, but I didn't want to miss that out. He, he was a, a Norman living in England before the Norman conquest. 
So when Edward the Confessor became king in 1242, he gave large English estates to many of his Norman friends, including Scrooge. In around 1050, Scrooge built a simple Motten Bailey fortification here, one of the earliest Norman castles in the country before the Norman invasion, and one of only four that King Edward allowed to be built during his reign. It's absolutely fantastic site and really, really, as soon as we can, get out and visit it. That's what I say. So thank you. That's Church of the Week. Now, unfortunately, I've got some bad news to share with you all. Um, and I'm very sorry to make this. You might have seen on social media or in the press. Unfortunately, our um, fantastic chairman, Mr. Peter Ainsworth, died very suddenly on Tuesday. He's been he's going to leave a, a really big hole. I mean, he's uh, been a fantastic guy and I've worked very hard with him for the past five years and he was a genuine champion of heritage. He had a great parliamentary career. career. He went on to chair the big lottery uh, fund, which is now the National Lottery uh, Community Fund. And he was also the chair of the Heritage Alliance, of which I'm a trustee as well. So I've worked very closely with him and he was a huge and um, passionate advocate for heritage in this country. You might not have seen all the work that he did, but he worked extremely hard behind the scenes uh, and had a huge network of people. Um, we've been delighted with all the, the tributes that have poured in that shows how much he was valued and how much his contribution was valued by people. He was, he was a very cultured man. Uh, very knowledgeable, uh, very wise, and also really great fun. And I had a fantastic working relationship with him over the years. And uh, I personally will miss him very, very sorely. Uh, but the whole of the heritage sector will miss him uh, greatly as well, as well as his his family, who who we really feel for at this very difficult time. So I just wanted to share that with you. There's a statement on our website, and you might have seen the the releases in the press. Um, that's all I have to say about I'm really sorry to to give that but over to you George. Thanks Peter and yeah uh, we're sorry to share that news but we thought it was important that we um, updated everyone so for this week um, there's not going to be any questions um, this week um, so if you have any questions in the future that you'd like to ask our chief executive um, please do um, comment away and we'll put them to Peter next week alternatively you can um, send um, an email to us at digital at the cct.org.uk but Everyone, a warm welcome and thank you for joining us today. It really is great to be um, seeing so many of you um, join us again. Um, if you are joining us for the first time, please do use that common feature on the um, left hand side of your screen, sorry, right hand side of your screens on Facebook and let us know um, if you're joining us for the first time and where you are joining us from. Now, um, as always, we're just going to give a quick um, tech overview for how these work. So at the moment, we're live streaming on Facebook. You can only watch these lectures live on Facebook, but they are recorded. Um, they are made available free of charge for you to watch on um, our Facebook playlist. Later on, I'll post a link um, to the playlist, or you can watch it on our YouTube channel. Um, as I said, these lectures are always free of charge. So if you see anyone commenting with links saying that you can watch them elsewhere, please do not click them because they're most likely scams um, where they try and ask credit card details for you to access the stream. Our lectures are always free of charge and if you can't find it or are having some difficulties just comment away or um, send us a direct message and um, me or one of my amazing team will be on hand to um, send you a link and help you get onto the stream. Now um, we always say um, if you are liking these lectures there's a couple of ways that you can show your love. You can firstly make sure that you share these videos um, and these live streams with your friends and family. Do please like and follow our Facebook and other digital accounts um, but also please do consider making a donation to support our work. Um, you'll shortly hear um, from our Chief Executive um, a bit more about us at the Trust and what we do but um, over last year we've had um, nearly a half a million pound shortfall in income um, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. So any donations anyone can make are most gratefully, gratefully received. Now you can donate on our website, which is um, completely secure, and that is at visitchurches.org.uk. You can donate via text. So if you've got a mobile phone, you can just text the letters CCT to 70331, and that will give us a gift of three pounds. Now, finally, um, last week we launched a brand new membership offer and the response has been overwhelming. But if you join us by direct debit for just £3.50 a month, um, 
using the offer code lecture at the checkout, you will be sent a free copy of this book. So last week we were joined by Dr. Richard Stem, who did a wonderful talk on the Scrivini Chapel in Padua. But um, this book is fantastic. As I said, it's got some great, great double page images here. You can see the Wilton Diptych here. Um, but this is a great introduction for knowing how to read a church basically and if you um, go traveling um, it fits in a backpack but as I said if you join us by direct debit from just £3.50 per month you will be sent a free copy of this. Now I should say that as I said we've been overwhelmed by the response um, to this um, and it's been so overwhelming that we've had to order um, uh, basically we've had to commission a brand new print run of these books so the books are being printed at the moment um, and they will be with us in um, towards the end of July so we hope to be able to post out your member book your free book um, at August in August however in the meantime you will still get your member welcome pack um, your pinnacle member magazine um, and some other wonderful um, goodies as well so um, if you've got any questions Questions, please do comment away. Now, finally, before I hand over to Peter Ayres, we've got another book today that we're talking about, and that is um, Professor Nigel Saul's book on the subject of today's lecture. So this was published um, quite recently. It was published late last year, um, and it was published, uh, Nigel was telling us, um, during the heat of the pandemic, and it's published by a um, very small publishing house. And it's a fantastic book. And um, we're selling it for just £10 plus postage and packaging. Um, we'll post a link to our website where you can get it. But it's got, um, and the reason why we chose Richard's Cast, because it's got a double spread about Richard's Castle in this book. Um, so if you enjoyed today's lecture, please do buy the book from us um, as any, um, all profits um, do help us in caring for historic churches. But if you've got any questions or any problems, please comment away or send us a direct message. Um, but I'm gonna pass you on to back to Peter Ayres. Um, so thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, George, and good to see you. I've just been reading in the comments. I'm very grateful for the person who stopped watching Bargain Hunt to come and watch this lecture. That was a good choice. And I hope you catch up with Bargain Hunt later on, but uh, hopefully this will be uh, uh, just as good. So no pressure to Nigel, I think, for his lecture today. Um, it's great to see you. As George said, uh, we're a charity. We were established in 1969. Uh, we're over 50 years, nearly 50 years old uh, now. and um, we were set up to sort of look after very historic churches across England, which no longer had a viable congregation. And in that time, we've collected 356. And on average, we take about two or three more every year. Now, we're not sure what the pandemic is going to impact on historic churches in this country. But I can tell you that the most historic churches are generally in the countryside with the smallest populations uh, and the most elderly populations as well. Uh, and the Church of England itself, amazingly, has, owns, well, 45% of all grade one listed buildings and places of worship. I mean, that is just an incredible number. So mm. what happens to these buildings in the future if less people are going to church or not worshipping in the same way or the demographics don't support them? We've got to find some way of looking after them long into the future. Now, the Trust takes the really best examples in the country that don't have a future and it tries to find ways to engage communities to support them in the long term and our mission really is to find ways to help communities keep the moral ownership of these buildings to keep them used and to keep them loved and in our view that love generally turns into that horrible thing money that we always need to talk about to keep them up and to keep them used but what's really important is that they remain these vital local assets and that's what we try very hard to do now, this year has hit us uh, very hard because uh, the focus of our efforts is all about engaging local communities and getting communities to use these buildings, which has been impossible due to the pandemic. And also getting tourists to come and visit has not been possible either. And that's why George referred to that half a million pound hole in our income that we've experienced during the year. So your support really is very, very welcome at this time in whatever way you choose to do that. So please do support us. Uh, every, every donation helps us keep these buildings on behalf of the nation well into the future and helps uh, local communities look after them and keep them uh, in the manner to which they should be because they're such a precious cultural resource in this country. So moving on to our lecture today, I'm very pleased to introduce to you uh, Nigel Saul. 
uh, who's going to talk to us about decorated in glory, church buildings in Herefordshire in the 14th century. And George has already shown you the fantastic book, which you'll be able to purchase as well. So Nigel Saul is the Emeritus Professor of Medieval History at Royal Holloway, University of London, and author of For Honour and Fame, Chivalry in England between 1066 and 1500, and also The English Gentry in the Parish Church in the Middle Ages, uh, published in 2017. And more recently, as you'll be aware, he's been drawn into the study of Herefordshire's medieval churches, of which we own a few. And so we're really looking forward to this. I'm very grateful to Nigel and all of our lecturers who give their time for free to support the work of the Churches Conservation Trust. And I'm sure you're in for an absolutely fascinating, uh, absolutely fascinating lecture. So, uh, Nigel, over to you and thank you very much. Thank you. Now on to full screen. Good, that's my title. Um, and uh, thank you for that very warm welcome this lunchtime. I guess for most of us, if we think about um, church architecture in Herefordshire in the Middle Ages, we think first and foremost of the great architectural achievements of the Romanesque period, that is to say, the 12th century, a period in which Herefordshire excelled and in which Herefordshire architecture was of national, not to say international importance. And here, I suppose, is the most photographed church door in England. It is, of course, the south door of Kjongpek, the supreme masterpiece of the 12th century Romanesque sculptors in Herefordshire in the March is dripping with the most exotic sculpture, some of it <clears throat> with stylistic sources in England, some of it with stylistic sources on the continent, some of it with stylistic sources in the Viking period, one thinks of these columns on the side. Another famous work of the Herefordshire Romanesque sculptors is this font at Castle Froom, uh, the baptism of Christ on the Castle Froom font. Um, here's the infant Christ, um, the Almighty pointing down to the infant Christ. There's his hand, dove on the right, the rippled waters of the River Jordan. And just in case you're in any doubt as to the fact that that's the River Jordan, the sculptor has very helpfully put a couple of fish in there to help you. And then on the left, the figure of John the Baptist with this extraordinarily outsized head. I think it's the terrific power of this sort of semi-abstract sculpture fitted onto the curved side of the font that makes it such a supreme masterpiece. There's another Herefordshire font, Erdersley, uh, with the two fighting men. Well, it's not that period that I'm going to be talking about today. Enough has been written about the Romanesque achievement of Herefordshire. What I want to talk to you about today is the architectural achievement of a later century, the early 14th century, the period known as the decorated period, the other great period in which Herefordshire excelled. Um, you'll remember back in the 19th century, Thomas Rickman divided English Gothic up into three successive periods. Early English, the first Gothic phase, that's a Salisbury Cathedral. Um, the second phase, decorated, which I'm talking about today. And then the third and final phase, um, perpendicular from roughly just after the Black Death up to the Reformation in the 16th century. And it's that middle period, decorated, that I'm talking about today. And it's a period in which Herefordshire excelled. And here is one of their most famous works, one of the windows on the great show front of the South Isle of Leinster Priory, the side of the church that you see when you walk up the path to the porch. And you can see why decorated is called decorated, can't you? It's dripping with ball flower ornament, characteristic form of decoration of the decorated period, particularly over here in the Welsh marches. 
the um, sides of the windows, the mullions, the tracery, all richly encrusted with ball flower. Ball flower is the term used to describe, <clears throat> see there are thousands of them, I should think, on this window. Um, they look like opening rosebuds. And then at the head, this elaborate window tracery. Never has a period of architecture been more aptly called than decorated. But it's not just buildings in which you find the decorated period showing off in Herefordshire. It's also in tomb sculpture. This is a very famous tomb, recently conserved, the tomb monument of Blanche Lady Grandison, died 1347 at Much Markham. And what it's famous for is the naturalistic touch represented by the lady's hem spilling over the sides of the chest to fall down in front of it. Marvellous touch by a master sculptor. <clears throat> and what about church roofs? Who's heard of King's Pile? It's in the hills west of Hereford, northwest of Hereford. It's wonderful. You step inside the church door there, into the nave, and you're absolutely gobsmacked by this roof. I'd never seen anything quite like this roof before. We were just gobsmacked by this roof. And there's another one, it continues round the corner into the South Chapel. Hard to date precisely, but that's about 1310, 1320. So we're also talking about the achievements of the carpenters. The man who made the most fundamental recent, fairly recent study of Herefordshire decorated uh, is this man, uh, the late Richard Morris. Um, sadly, he died four or five years ago. He was reader in the history of art at the University of Warwick. And here he is in characteristic pose in one of the window bays of the Great Hall at Kenilworth. Uh, he lived at Kenilworth and he wrote the English Heritage Guidebook to the castle. Now, Morris's 1972 Courtauld Institute, University of London PhD thesis was on Herefordshire decorated. And it remains the point of departure for all modern studies of decorated architecture in the county. And Morris's argument was briefly this, that the um, creative achievement of architecture and sculpture in Herefordshire in the first half of the 14th century it was the work of a teams of about four or five teams of masons. Um, there was one team, perhaps the earliest operating, uh, based at Hereford, and it then moved on to work on the parish churches of the county, was the team that worked at Lemster, which you've seen, Ledbury, the North Chapel, um, Webley, and very importantly, outside the county, the South Isle of Gloucester Abbey, now Gloucester Cathedral. That was one team. Then there was a second team that worked in the Wye Valley, west of Hereford, Deaton Bishop, Madley, Allensmoor. There was a third team that worked west of Lemster in Stretford Hundred on the Welsh border that created the churches of um, uh, Pembridge, Lions Hall, perhaps Kinnersley, churches around there on the main road from, broadly the main road from Lemster to the Welsh border. And then finally, and we're almost up at the Black Death by this time, a team in the extreme north of the county um, that was responsible for work at um, uh, Kingsland and the final phase of work at Richard's Castle. So Morris's argument that was that there were about four or five teams, teams of masons. We don't use the word architects or builders in the Middle Ages. We tend to talk about masons. And masons were quite versatile people who worked up through the trade, actually starting off fashioning the stone and then moved on to taking over designing them. And that in Herefordshire, in the first half of the 14th century, there were four or five teams of such men who were going around rebuilding the churches and carving tomb monuments in their spare time. Now, 
how did Morris work all of this out? On what evidence did he base this reconstruction of the architectural history of the county? Well, he did it by looking at molding profiles. Richard Morris was the high priest of the study of molding profiles. And what I mean by that is the distinct shapes given to such features as the distinct profiles given to such features as window splays, um, pillar bases, capitals, the soffits, that's to say the underside of arches. These would be the Mason's trademark, his signature, if you like, as he went about his work from church to church. And what I'm going to show you is the V-shaped molding, which was characteristic of the work of the Mason in the second team, who worked at Allen's Moor Eaton Bishop and Madley. And if you look, you see you've got this V-shaped molding running vertically up the splay. And you've got exactly the same thing here at Madley, just a couple of miles up the road. And you've got exactly the same thing again at Eaton Bishop, which is in between the two villages, same V-shaped groove. And Morris argued that this shows they were all the work of the same Mason architect. Now he subsequently refined his views a bit and other people have helped refine them. But I think in its essentials, his reconstruction and his identifications have stood the test of time. Unfortunately, ever so unfortunately, we do not have the names of any of the Herefordshire Mason sculptors in this period, but we can track their movements by looking at molding profiles in the way that I have described. Now, I don't want to reinvent the wheel by going over all Richard Morris's work all over again. What I want to do is treat it as the foundation, the point of departure for a series of very different questions that interest me as, a, as an historian. I'm not an architectural historian by training. Um, I, as it were, I forgive the phrase, a sort of mainstream historian. And I'm interested in the political, the social, the religious history of the Middle Ages. And my particular period is the 14th century, which is why I'm talking about decorating today. So I'm, in, I'm going to be asking, there is a three or four questions that interest me as an historian. And the first is, why was there so much building in Herefordshire in the decorated period? And I say there are two main periods when there's a boom in activity in Herefordshire. One was the Romanesque period, the age of Kilpeck and so forth in the 12th century, and the other is the decorated period in the early 14th century. So why was there so much building in this period in particular? Second, people have to commission it. So who were the main patrons? And I'm going to be identifying three main groups, the churchmen, the Mortimer family, the Earls of March, who were of course the main aristocratic family in the central marches in this period. And then thirdly, the knightly class, the country gentry. Thirdly, somebody's got to pay the bills. They didn't build these places for nothing. How was it all paid for? Where did the money come from? And then fourthly, and this is a story that will lead us back to Richard's castle, which Peter very helpfully mentioned at the beginning. When did it all end? Where did it all end? And why? Because end it surely did. All good stories come to an end. So I begin with the first question. Why was there so much church building in Herefordshire in the first half of the 14th century? And I think there are three main reasons. One is the cult of St. Thomas Cantaloupe. Second is the foundation of so many chantries. And the third is the rebuilding program going on at this place, Hereford Cathedral, in this very same period. And why was there so much rebuilding going on at Hereford Cathedral? Because of the cult of Hereford's own saint, with which I begin. Hereford's own saint, Thomas Cantaloupe, who was bishop from 1275 to 1282, and by a stroke of good fortune, 
His shrine in the north transept of the cathedral still survives, or to be more precise, the shrine base. And the canopy on the top is a wonderful, very evocative modern reconstruction of the lost original. And it's being sensed by, I think, the Dean of Hereford, Michael Tavenor, um, very appropriately. So who was Thomas Canterbury? Why does he matter in our story? As I said, he was made Bishop in 1275. Um, he was a, the younger son of an important Welsh marcher family. Being a younger son, best in the church, he went to Oxford, continued his studies in France at Orléans, and then returned to Oxford and became chancellor of the university there. The Cantaloupes were very strong supporters of the baronial reform movement, which burst upon England after 1258 and gave rise to the bitter struggle between King Henry III and the Lord Edward on the one hand and Simon de Montfort, the leader of the baronial reform movement on the other. The Montfort came to power in 1264, took control of Henry III's government, and he made Thomas Cantaloupe his chancellor. So for a year from 1264 to 65, Cantaloupe was chancellor, in effect, head of the government and head of the civil service. But on the 4th of August, 1265, de Montfort was of course defeated and killed and his body mutilated at the Battle of Evesham. Cantaloupe lost his job and wisely saw fit to retreat again to France, continuing his studies. But he was unexpectedly brought back from France in 1275 to become Bishop of Hereford. And in the next few years, the years of his episcopate, he proved himself an, uh, an active and highly conscientious diocesan. And he appears to have made quite an impact in the diocese. He moved around the parishes. He did a lot of preaching. We're told by one source, for example, that he used an interpreter. So I guess he would have preached in French or Latin and his words would have been translated into the local vernacular so that all the listeners could hear him. Unfortunately, however, he fell out with the then Archbishop of Canterbury, John Peckham, who was a very cantankerous man, dreadful man, I think, very cantankerous and argumentative. And in order to uh, pursue his case, he went to Italy, um, Canterbury, that is, went to Italy uh, to see the Pope. And unfortunately, he died there. He caught fever and died there in the summer of 1282. But his remains were brought back to Hereford and interred in the cathedral. And then very quickly, something remarkable happened. Miracles were reported. Miracles, lots of them. Quite spontaneously, a cult developed around Cantaloupe's remains. So in 1287, five years after his death, Dean and Chapter commissioned this new monument in the North Transept, which happily still survives. In the North Transept, very conveniently accessible along the aisle from the North Porch, which then as now constituted the main entrance to the cathedral. More and more pilgrims poured in, and this became the most popular pilgrimage site in England after the Shrine of Becket at Canterbury. Between roughly the 12, between 1290 and about um, 1320, something like 700 miracles were reported at Canterbury's tomb. So of course the cathedral initiated a campaign for his canonization, spearheaded by Cantaloupe's successor in the sea, his former secretary, Richard Swinfield. And finally, in 1320, canonization was granted and Hereford had its own saint, Saint Thomas Cantaloupe. You'll have noticed that last year was the 700th anniversary of Cantaloupe's canonization. And it was to be the occasion for many celebratory events at the cathedral, pretty well all of which, of course, fell victim to the coronavirus pandemic but one hopes that as many as possible of them will be rearranged for this year. Now, what's the significance of all this, you might ask, to my story about decorated architecture in the diocese? And the point is this. 
that the cult of Canterbury, Hereford's own saint, set off a great spiritual renewal in the diocese, a great resurgence of piety and spiritualism, as more and more local people went to the cathedral and were healed there. And they took an immense pride in Canterbury because he was Herefordshire's own saint. And this worked through, as I say, into a spiritual renewal in the county, which in turn spilled over into an enthusiasm for church building. And not just church building, but church fittings too. And you can see here in this remarkable window a few miles from Hereford at Credon Hill, the process of popular canonization of people making their own saints before formal canonization was granted by the Pope at work. Because what we're looking at here in this window in the chancel, time is on the left, the figure of Thomas Beckett, England's premier saint, uh, Cantuar, you see at the top, Archbishop of Canterbury, and then on the right, the figure of Cantaloupe. By dint of association, Cantaloupe is being launched on the way to becoming a saint himself. This deliberate coupling forms part, I think, of a popular canonization campaign, encouraging people to think of Cantaloupe as a saint. And I say to think of Cantaloupe as a saint, because on stylistic grounds, this window can be dated to circa 13510, almost certainly commissioned by the rector, Philip Talbot, a canon of Hereford. That is to say it was commissioned at least 10 years before formal canonization was granted by the Pope. So much for Cantaloupe and his cult. Second reason why I think um, uh, there was a lot of church building in Herefordshire in this period was this. Um, it's the foundation of lots and lots of chantry chapels in parish churches across the county. Now, here, forgive me if I digress for a moment, sketch the background. What do we mean by a chantry? Incidentally, I like the way the bicycles plonk there, don't, don't you? It's just like the way our newspaper boy plonks his bicycle from you know, our front garden as he delivers the paper in the morning. But, but why chantry chapels? To understand this, you need to remember that the medieval church was actually much more interested in the afterlife than it was in our life here on earth now. Um, what they said was that after we die, um, some souls of the blessed saints like Cantaloupe will go straight to heaven on the fast track. Everyone else goes down to hell. All the sinners go down to hell. Fairly shortly, however, and certainly by the 10th and 11th centuries, theologians were applying their mind to this and thinking, well, that just doesn't work, does it? Because most of us fall somewhere in between. We agree we're not good enough to go on the fast track straight to heaven, but equally, um, we're a mixture of good and evil, but we're not that bad that we go down to the eternal torments of hell. Surely, logically, there must be somewhere in between. And that place they invented was, of course, called purgatory. So the belief was that most souls after death went into this halfway house, this clearing house of purgatory, where they were tried and tested before the Almighty eventually decided whether we go up to heaven or down to the eternal fires of hell. <clears throat> and the church further taught that the fate of the soul in purgatory could be helped and its progress to heaven accelerated by two things. The prayers of the living faithful, and the good works performed by the deceased in his lifetime and provision which he made himself in his will for prayers to be endowed after his death. Intercessory prayers and masses. That was to provide these, of course, that monasteries were founded in huge number in the 11th and 12th centuries. Monasteries were founded and endowed by their founders specifically as storehouses of prayer, provide prayers and intercession for the soul after their deaths. But founding a monastery was an extraordinarily expensive act, of course. 
not everyone can afford it. Only very wealthy could afford it. So what about the rest of us? Well, by the 13th century, theologians and lawyers have come up with a solution to that problem, and that solution was the chantry. And the word chantry describes a side altar in an existing church. Providing for a side altar in a side aisle, for example, at which you would pay for a priest or chaplain, say, prayers and masses for your soul for as long as you could afford. And those who could afford something decent, middling classes, the knights, the gentry, would often commission a purpose-built chapel bolted onto the side of the church in order to contain the side altar and their own tomb next to it. And that's what you're looking here at this example of the Honga, is Sir Richard de Pembridge's Chantry Chapel, uh, containing the side altar and his tomb, built on the side of the church in 1340. Well, the early 1340s. Here's another example, an honorific position on the north side, a few miles away at Dilwyn. What I want to suggest is that the high point for the foundation of Chantries and the building of Chantry Chapel is precisely in our period, the first half of the 14th century. The legal means were sort of brought into being in the 12th century. And to judge from the evidence of Chantry licenses, boom time for the founding and building of Chantries was the first half of the 14th century. Here is the most extraordinary one of all. Fascinating church, West Hyde, northeast of Hereford, where an unknown proprietor, we don't know his name, paid for the building of this grand new south aisle. And his tomb is built into the south wall for his chantry, and it completely overshadows the rest of the church. The rest of the church is tiny. The main part of the nave is the other side. It's invisible and completely out of view. And I love this lovely stumpy 12th century West Tower. Doesn't it breathe the atmosphere of the Welsh marches? More like a castle keep into which everyone would retreat, re retreat when the latest Welsh raid comes. But this 14th century Chantry Chapel almost towers over the tower. So that's my second point. Lots of Chantry foundations, which means that Herefordshire architecture in the decorated period um, consists very often of micro-architecture, small additions to churches rather than end-to-end -end rebuildings themselves. And where did people find all the builders, all the masons? The answer is they went to Hereford. Because to go back to the cult of Canterbury, all of a sudden Hereford Cathedral became rich from the offerings of all the pilgrims flocking past Canterbury's shrine. And what did they do with the money? Well, they did what cathedrals always do with it. They rebuilt the place. So externally, it's different inside, but externally, Hereford Cathedral presents the aspect largely of a decorated building. Um, they rebuilt all the aisles, uh, the transepts, the eastern chapels, central tower, and of course, originally, there was a big west tower as well, until that fell down in the 18th century. So where did the people out in the diocese who wanted to commission some rebuilding work, where did they get the masons? They went to the cathedral because um, outside the building periods, um, masons were available. And then when the building program at, at the cathedral wound down as it did after 1320, then all these masons would be looking for work elsewhere and they scattered out far and wide across the diocese. Um, so that's why you've got a building force in Herefordshire in this period, because they use builders from the cathedral. Now, moving on to my second theme, the patrons who commissioned church building in the county and diocese. And um, my first heading is the churchman. Now, you may well think churchman, well, that's obvious, isn't it? building churches, of course, it's going to be churchmen. It wasn't actually quite as simple as that, because by the 13th century, a rule of thumb had emerged, whereby a division of responsibility for maintenance was worked out. And the general convention was that the incumbent, the rector, was responsible for the maintenance of the chantry, his own 
part of the church, while the laity, the congregation, are responsible for everything west of the chancel arch, that is to say the nave, the tower, the porch. So when you're looking at clerical patronage, um, you'll look to the chancel. And what I'm showing you here, in each case, I'm just going to give you one case study to illustrate my argument, otherwise we'll be here all afternoon. My case study here is Eton Bishop, which I mentioned earlier, just southwest of Hereford. And it contains quite simply the most important medieval stained glass window in Herefordshire and a window of national importance, dateable to about 1328 to 1330, survives almost intact. And what you're looking at here is the figure of the crucifixion of Christ in the central light, upper middle. Then below, working from the left, um, the Virgin and Child. Secondly, St. Michael weighing souls. In the figure, in the center, the figure of a bishop, almost certainly I'd have thought Thomas Cantaloupe himself. Then to the right, the Archangel Gabriel. There, the head of Christ probably reset, filling the place of another figure now lost. Above them all, magnificent tall canopies stretching upwards. And then below, a series of donor figures. Figures kneeling a prayer saying, please don't forget me, remember to pray for me because I helped pay for this wonderful window. The most famous panel is of course, the celebrated Virgin and Child, which once graced the cover jacket of the original Herefordshire Pevsner. Um, wonderfully sensitive example of the glazier's art, showing the Christ child fondling the chin of his mother. And the Virgin is given this very curvaceous figure, which is characteristic of the art of the decorated period. Now we're looking at one of the donor figures. We're looking at this chap at the bottom of central light. And um, it's difficult to read, I realize, but it tells you that it was Adam Muramuth, the cantor of Hereford Cathedral. There he is kneeling at prayer, canon of Hereford, um, almost certainly one of the donors of the window, which is why he's there. But I put him on the screen because in another capacity, he was also a chronicler. Um, I'm afraid to say he was an absentee parson, um, not uncommon in the medieval church, of course. He was spent most of his time as a royal administrator, diplomat, negotiator, and the chronicle that he wrote, Miramut's Chronicle, is one of the most important sources for the opening phases of the Hundred Years' War. So that's a window of importance for all sorts of reasons, and it's the best in Herefordshire. Ah, yes. Um, I'm cheating a little bit here. This is actually lay patronage, but it's connected with the church. Um, this is Madley, an enormous church, spectacular. Just look at the place. And it dwarfs the tiny, tiny little village at its feet. You see Madley Church for miles away. The reason why it's so enormous is that it housed a miracle working statue of the Virgin, uh, probably housed in the crypt. What I'm interested in now is this spectacular South Isle. Who built it and why? There are no clues inside, it's empty. It's actually quite disappointing inside. There are no tombs. Stained glass is all gone. Uh, there, there's very little to tell you who was responsible and why. But I want to suggest that the essential clue is afforded by the name that it's known for centuries, the Chilston Isle. And Chilston was one of the manors in the parish of Madley, and it was held by a knightly family, the Dunrys. And the key thing here is that the Dunrys married into the Swinfield family. I think I mentioned earlier that Cantaloupe's successor in the sea, the man who promoted his canonization, was his former secretary, Richard Swinfield. Swinfield was Bishop of Hereford for a long time, from 1282, to his death in 1317. Now, of course, being a churchman, he had no children to carry on the family name, but he had brothers and they had children. And one of the Swinfield nieces married into the Dunry family. 
So I think the Dunleys became bearers of the Swinfield family memory. And actually going back through Swinfield, they had this link to Cantaloupe. We know that the Dunleys founded a chantry in Hereford Cathedral, and I think that's what they've done here. They've established a complementary chantry foundation at Madley. As I've said, there are no tombs inside it. I think they were probably buried in the cathedral, Swinfield's Cathedral, and before him, Cantaloupe's. I'm now going on to my second heading, the Mortimers as patrons, the far and away the most important magnate family in the central Welsh marches. Now, you don't normally think of them as a very pious family, quite the reverse. The first Earl in our period was Roger Mortimer, Queen Isabella's paramour, two together, bumped off Edward II, and for the first three years of the reign of the young Edward III, Mortimer and his lover ruled England together. Pretty self-seeking, ambitious, avaricious sort of man he comes across that. But he had a conventional sort of piety. He founded Chantries. Here is the quite big Chantry Chapel that he built on the northern side of Lentwood Iron Church in the north of the county. Near Ludlow, which was the castle at which he was based, he built a chapel, <coughs> excuse me, now ruinous, but you can see very clearly here the Y-shaped window tracery, so very characteristic of Herefordshire, decorated. But interestingly, in Mortimer country, in the north of the county, there was a lot of church building going on in our period. Walton, Kingsland in the Lug Valley, big church, can you see? Big rambling place. And the best of all, the jewel in the crown, Pembridge. This is a most big and spectacular parish church. It knocks you for six. Why is Pembridge not in Simon Jenkins's thousand best? It ought to be. It's crying out for inclusion. Just look at the place. Um, Pembridge in the Middle Ages had aspirations of being a small borough, a small market town. It never quite made it. And it's sunk back into village status. It's very pretty, very picturesque, like a white village. Um, it had a marketplace, and you walk up from the marketplace through this very cathedral-like close, close-like churchyard. There's the church on the right, and its most famous feature, the detached tower to its west. Because there's no west tower, you get a rather cathedral-like west front with a big window. And then the ground plan is nave, chancel, transepts each side. That's the interior. Um, big, light, spacious. That slide doesn't really do justice to that sensation of sheer size that you experience when you open the door and you step inside Pembridge Church. There on the right, some of the um, painted decoration survives. Now the question I want to ask is who built all these churches? I can tell you it wasn't Roger Mortimer. Who built all these churches? There's a lot of church building going on in Mortimer country in North Herefordshire. So what I did was look at the land holding evidence to see who was the Lord of the Manor or Lady of the Manor of all these villages in our period. And what I found was that it was very interesting. In every single case, the Lady of the Manor, Pembridge, Alton, Kingsland, all the others, was Margaret Mortimer. Earl Rogers' mother and the long-lived widow of Edmund Lord Mortimer, who died back in 1304, Earl Rogers' father. Margaret survived him for a long time. She was one of these long-lived medieval widows. She survived him for 34 years, for 30 years, to die in 1334. It was she who was Lady of the Manor in all these places. I want to suggest that it was she who was the person who was responsible for building them. Why do I say that? Because these were all villages at which she lived, at which there were Mortimer castles. At Pembridge, the castle was on what's now called Farm, immediately south of the church. This is Kingsland, 
site of the castle in what's now an open field to the west of the church. And you can walk there and ramble around the earthworks of the former Mortimer Castle. So Margaret, these were all manors owned by Margaret. These were all castles of which she moved around. When she woke up in the morning at um, Kingsland Castle and pulled back her bedroom curtains, she looked at Kingsland, Ch Kingsland Church. And she did the same at Pembridge. She looked out over Pembridge Church. She regarded these as very much her own churches, um, extensions of Mortimer Parr, if you like. They were almost in the outer bailey of these castles. They were a bit like palace chapels. I think she had a very proprietorial attitude to them. She used them as theatres of display. We know from antiquarian notes that the stained glass windows of these churches were at one time all filled with grand displays of Mortimer heraldry, advertising the family and their family alliances. These were theatres of display. And it's important to remember that in the last years of her life, Lady Margaret was in a sense, the last Mortimer still standing. Roger had been overthrown and executed in 1330. His son and heir died a year later, leaving a grandson who was way under age. The only senior Mortimer adult left standing was Margaret. No wonder she wanted to represent Mortimer Parr in the very dramatic way in which she did in these parish churches. Now, very quickly, I'm moving down the social scale to the gentry, uh, the knights and the squires. And my case study here is another lovely church, Little Hereford in the Teem Valley, west of Tenbury Wells. We're standing in the chantry and we're looking at the two tomb recesses in the North, Wale, the North Wall to accommodate which I think the chancel was rebuilt in the early 14th century. This is a church, this is a chancel, which was intended as the burial place, the mausoleum of the local lords of the manor, who were the de la Mare family. Later member of the family, Peter de la Mare, was the first speaker of the House of Commons in 1376, by virtue of his office, as it were, the lineal ancestry of Lindsay Hoyle today. Um, now, if we turn left, face west, that is the site that greets us at Little Hereford. Note how tiny the chancel arch is. It reinforces the sense of this chancel as a private space, a private space for the use of the lords of the manor and their burial place after they've departed. Roy polloi, they're the other side. And I think the presence of the curtains there, which when pulled across keep out the draft, reinforces the sense of this chancel as a private space. Um, in the Middle Ages, of course, that have been a screen there, locking out visual access into the chancel. This is a dramatic case of the lower, lo local lord of the manor taking over appropriating the chancel for his own use as a family mausoleum. Very, very common story when you go church visiting uh, medieval churches. Very quickly, my next theme, third one, I think, is who paid for it all and how. And I'm looking here at the annual valuation of Margaret Mortimer's estates according to the Inquisition post-mortem taken after her death in 1334. These are annual figures, medieval money, of course, but they're very striking and very instructive. Erdisland in the west of the county, annual worth 34 pounds. Pembridge, 53. Kingsland, 59. Alton, 60. Kenton, four pounds. Widmore, the Mortimer family seat, a whopping 129 pounds. And of course, over the border, they had wide estates in Wales, the Lordship of Radnor, worth 59 pounds per annum, the Lordship of Christine, <coughs> 10. Totting them all up, I'm not awfully good at sums, but I think this is right, 
gives you an annual income for Margaret of 405 pounds. To put that in perspective, the threshold income to support knighthood was 40, 40, 10 times that figure. Then our Lord Duke was generally reckoned at the time you needed an income of about 900 or 1,000. So she's slap bang in the middle between those two. She is of baronial rank. 400 pounds per annum is the kind of income, annual income, you would expect a baron to have. She was of baronial rank living on the estates of her da. No wonder, no wonder she could afford to engage in church building in such a big way. But let's break down that figure again. Where did that 400 come from? Well, the medieval aristocracy, the medieval landowning class, drew their income from two main sources. One was the rents paid by their peasant tenants, and the other was the sales of the produce from their home farms, their own lands. And I think the latter is the important one here, because it's important to bear in mind that Herefordshire and the Welsh Marches were one of the main wool producing areas of England at this time. The clips from the sheep, the hills of Herefordshire and the Welsh Marches, areas like Wigmore and Radnor, the clips from those sheep were the most sought after of all, even more than the clips from the Gloucestershire Cotswolds. And this was boom time for English wool exports. You were to plot English wool exports on a graph. You have to picture them going up, up and up to a peak in about 1300, 1310, and then dropping downwards again thereafter, quite rapidly. So the period of decorated architecture, the period we're talking about here, was precisely the period when wool sales were at their peak. And this was the best wool area in England. Again, I repeat, no wonder Margaret Mortimer could afford to engage in church building in such a big way. And my final theme, not before time, when did it all end and why? And I'm immensely grateful to Peter at the beginning for setting the scene by telling you all about Richard's castle because it saves me a lot of effort now. I wanted to end up with a church's conservation trust church. And we have, as Peter said, one of the very best here in Richard's Castle. And it makes my point for me very, very well. It takes its name, as Rick, Peter said at the beginning, from Richard who built the castle, which is to the west of the church, to the left over there. And it's the presence of the castle which accounts for the detached tower, which is offset to the east of the chancel. If it had been in its usual position at the west, it would have got in the way. So you built the tower offside to the east. It's at the top of a very steep hill, as you can see. You, well, you see, we parked the car, got out of the car, walked up to the gate, and if you turn around and look in the other direction, you get the most fantastic view right back over the Teem Valley as the Teem flows down from. Ludlow into Worcestershire. That's a spectacular setting, um, originally church and castle together. And you can see as well, it's scenically very beautiful. We went there a few years ago in May in the spring and all the blossom was, st was still out. You open the door, it creaks open, you step inside, and you've already been given a taste of what Richard's castle is like inside. It's enormously atmospheric. And as Peter shows, it still preserves all of its original fittings. The core of the church was Norman, but it was substantially rebuilt in the decorated period. We're here in the South Isle, and uh, you've got the telltale mark of decorated, um, the ball flower ornament on the capital of this pillar, and that one again. This is about 1310, 1320, almost certainly built as a chantry chapel by the lords of the manor, who were a junior branch of the Mortimer family. Just fancy that, as they say in private life, one of the junior branches of the Mortimers. They were a family a bit like the people of Israel who went forth and multiplied. 
So here we're 1310, 1320. Then we walk down the length of the nave, turn left, look into the North Chapel, and you see it has a very different architectural look. Um, stylistically, this dates from the 1350s, no earlier. What you're looking at is a crenellated capital, no ball flower. That age is left well behind. Crenellated capital is characteristic of the perpendicular period, as likewise these square-headed windows. This Chantry Chapel, built by the Talbots, the successors of the Mortimers, dates from the 1350s. In other words, to trace the ending of our story, we need go no further than Richard's Castle. South Isle, decorated, North Chapel, the beginnings of Perth. So decorated ended in the 1350s. And if we ask why, you don't have to be over subtle to work out the answer because the building trade was killed stone dead by the Black Death. Probably easier to get a plumber on a Sunday than it was to get a builder in England in the 1350s. This is way outside our area, but it's Northborough Church near Peterborough. And it's a slide I always used to use when teaching to illustrate the effects of the Black Death. You see, the Lord of the Manor here started rebuilding the church by building this very grandiose South Chapel just before the Black Death. And he obviously had in mind rebuilding the hall of the rest of the church, otherwise it would have looked silly. Um, but the Black Death got in the way, killed the project Stone Dead, presumably wiped out his family as well. So you end up with this funny looking lopsided little church. So the short answer is Herefordshire decorated with killed stone dead by the Black Death. You needed lots of skilled sculptors for Herefordshire for, for decorated architecture and there weren't any. But it then begs the question, why did it not recover? Because in many other parts of England, of course, the trade church building did recover, did recover. Um, in many other parts of England, you find perpendicular churches in abundance. Think of East Anglia, think of the West Country, Somerset, Gloucestershire, Cornwall. In Cornwall, nearly every church is perpendicular 15th century. Well, in all these other parts of the country, you've got special reasons. Cornwall, it was the tin trade. In other parts of the country, it was the cloth trade. Cloth making never really took off in Herefordshire. You see, by the end of the 14th century and the 15th century, I say, why export all our wool to Flanders and made into cloth there? We can make it up into cloth here. We can make it up into cloth here. And that's what they did. But in Herefordshire, they didn't. I think probably the main reason is the successful cloth making in the Middle Ages, you needed pulling mills. And to have pulling mills, you needed fast growing streams, fast running streams spilling down the hillside of the Cotswold escarpment. That doesn't really work for Herefordshire. You've actually got remarkably few side streams, side rivers running down from the Welsh marshes. You've just got the team and the wine. So the conditions for cloth making didn't really exist in Herefordshire. And other than at a few towns like Ludlow and Leominster, cloth making never really took off. You're looking for a grand perpendicular church in the central marches. You have, of course, to go to Ludlow. North Isle here is decorated. The rest of the church, Perp, with its tremendous tower, which you can see for miles off. That's the exception that proves the rule. Otherwise, there's very little perpendicular architecture in the central marches, which is actually good news for us. It's our good fortune because it meant that the decorated achievement in the county was never destroyed and wiped away to make a way for Perp. Decorated churches were never rebuilt. They are there for us to enjoy today in one of England's loveliest counties, which is why I was drawn to writing about it for this book, Decorated in Glory, which Logiston very kindly published at the height of the lockdown. Um, and one of the beauties of church visiting in Herefordshire is that they're all open, all unlocked, or at least in normal times, they're all unlocked. So you can just wander around 
drop in and enjoy wonderful churches like Pembridge, Kingsland, and of course, Richard's Castle. Thank you so, so much, um, Nigel. That's been phenomenal. And the comments coming in have been really, really heartwarming. So I'm just going to um, stop your screen sharing there for a moment and we'll yeah. go into question time in a moment. Um, but everyone, as um, Nigel said, he's um, he's published um, a really fantastic, fantastic book. And I see there's been some really wonderful comments saying about some of the detail. Well, some of the um, pictures, so I know, um, people talking about some of the carvings, you can see some fantastic pictures in here with some of those close up um, carvings and details in the book, as well as some great full page images. And as I said, Richard's Castle is mentioned in this book. So if you'd like to buy it, you can buy it from us for just 10 pounds plus potion packaging. And we've put a link on, but I'll put another link on shortly. Now we're gonna dive into question time quickly. So we've had already quite a few questions coming in. So I'm gonna jump straight in. Um, Were, um, oh, I'm just trying to, trying to find one here. Um, so um, were OG, uh, are OG windows from the decorated period, um, firstly, Nigel? Yes. Until about 1290, canopies were generally straight-sided. The OG arch comes in in the decorated period. And of course, they loved it. They loved it. Um, if you want OG, not so much in Herefordshire, actually. English architecture was very regional. Each region had its own particular speciality. Herefordshire's speciality, as you saw, was ball flower. If you want OGs, place to go to, above all, is Ely Cathedral, right at the other end of the country, the Ely Lady Chapel. Fantastic. I, and I won't uh, disagree with that because I used to work for Ely Cathedral, so um, I, I would totally... Oh, lucky you. Um, You've shown us some really interesting chantry chapels, and um, in comparison with the rest of the country, did Herefordshire have a lot more chantry chapels, do you think, or do you think a lot more chantry chapels survive in Herefordshire um, today compared with the rest of the country? A bit of both. Um, I think they're a nationwide phenomenon all over the country, but you see far more of them surviving in Herefordshire because of the point I made at the end, there's no perpendicular rebuilding. So they're all still there. Thank you, Nod. And um, when you talked about um, the Mortimers and you talked about um, Margaret Mortimer, um, was her church building, because you mentioned that it was a, a, she had this disposable income and she showed, she did sort of um, um, to assert the power of her family and sort of show off it. Was there also an element of her trying to secure um, you know, sort of try and gain um, benefits for when she died? Do you think there's uh, that comes into play as well with her um, church building? Or do you think it was really political? No, I painted a rather one-dimensional picture of Margaret, and I'm deeply conscious of that, um, to compress it all into the time available. Um, there is now a lot of scholarly writing on female aristocratic piety in the Middle Ages. The point I wanted to make in the talk, because it happened to sort of fit in with my general theme, was that in the period when she's building all these churches, she is in a sense the last Mortimer standing. But I do not in any way question that she was a particularly pious person. When spending all their money, these people were making choices. She could have chosen to spend it on other things. She didn't. She chose to spend it on parish church building. And I think it was partly self-interest, because as we know from the heraldry, um, they were full of Mortimer coats of arms. But I think it is also good works and genuinely wanting to help the parish in each of these places. Um, I, I don't think it's entirely self-interest. We're all motivated by a variety of factors. And I think so too was she. So I'm actually very glad that you or the questioner has asked me to enlarge on that, because I, I think it is important to stress genuine piety as well. Women, just sorry, just one other point. Women, you see, had the leisure in retirement. We're, we're now learning that they were actually very active as readers. When you think about the wonderful Bibles, the wonderful books of ours, the wonderful psalters that we have from the late Middle Ages, many of these were commissioned by women. Women were readers as well. Yeah, and I think it's really 
interesting the point that you made about Margaret um, Mortimer because um, for those of you who watched live streams last week for this last week I was um, had the fortune to be um, at um, Langport um, Langport um, in Somerset where um, the church was heavily endowed um, by Margaret Beaufort that you know in some ways the founder of the House of Tudor and it's really interesting actually there are some really fantastic examples in English history where women sort of you know some of our most wonderful churches in some ways have been built and larger endowed um, by women from very powerful families. Um, and it's really interesting what the point you've just made there, Professor, all about um, women also um, being involved as readers in churches, because I don't think many people will um, actually have been aware about that. Um, another question that's come in, um, and we've got time for maybe a couple more questions, but um, when they decided to build sort of their um, chantries or enlargements, was there a deciding factor um, if they would build on the north side of the church or on the south side first? Traditionally, the north side was regarded as the honorific. So if you could bag the north side, you would do so. But in some churches, um, in Herefordshire, a good example is Bishopstone, one family had already bagged the north side. Then um, they died out in the male line and a later family came along. And they wanted to build a child for chapel. So they had to go for the south side. So you end up, as it were, accidentally with a cruciform church. In other villages, again, Kildry and Berkshire is one I know, um, there were more than, was more, more than one manor in the parish. So there were two gentry families. So one gentry family built a chapel on the north side, another gentry family built a chapel on the south side. Again, you end up with a cruciform church. But north side first. Thank you for that. And I think a nice question maybe to try and sum up and finish on. Um, it's a bit of a merge of two here. So what's your favourite chancel? And what is your favourite example of a Herefordshire church that was built in the 14th century? My favourite chancel would be Eton Bishop because of that window. So Eton Bishop. And my favourite Herefordshire church of all, well, two equal, two equal, um, Pembridge and Richard's Castle. Richard's Castle for atmosphere. And I'm so glad that Peter spoke about it at the beginning because he's made the point and you saw much better pictures than mine. Peter was able to talk about it at length. It's enormously atmospheric. I remember first visiting it about 30 or 40 years ago and it knocked me for six then and going back with it there uh, with, with my wife many years later, um, it still made an enormous impact. It's, it's just tremendous. Setting the architecture, the atmosphere, all the fittings inside. Um, but for sheer architectural splendor, sheer architectural distinction, Pembridge, without any doubt at all, it amply justifies that overused adjective cathedral-esque. Why on earth Simon Jenkins didn't include it in his book is utterly beyond me. I'm a great fan of Simon Jenkins, let me tell you. I don't want to offend it with his watch here. I'm a great fan of, you know, all church crawlers love that book, don't we? One of the most heavily fun books on my shelves over there. But I think um, uh, I'd have willingly sacrificed somewhere else in order to work Pembridge in. Well, thank you so much for answering those questions there. Um, Simon Jenkins is one of our trustees, so next time um, I see him, I'll, I'll make the point. <laughs> I think you should have put yes. it in, um, Simon. But um, Professor, thank you so much for taking time to um, do this wonderful, wonderful lecture with us today. As I said, the questions coming through have been great, and I'm sorry if we haven't had time to answer for your questions, but I'll keep an eye on them and I will try and get back to them. Um, and you can get my email address off the internet. There we go, everyone. And we'll, um, we can, um, if you've got any other questions, um, send them to us and we can also provide, if you can't find that email address, um, I can send you the email address from the internet as well. Um, so as I said, everyone, at the start, um, if you'd like to buy Professor Saul's book, you can do so. We'll post a link to the book again shortly now. Um, £10 per spoken packaging. Um, also, if you want to become a member with us, I see there's been a couple of comments. Um, I'll just clarify again. So if you become a member with us by direct debit, so that's just from £3.50 per month. Um, 
and use the offer code when you check out lecture and that's lecture in capitals you will get sent a free copy of Dr Richard Semp's book The Secret Language of Churches and Cathedrals Decode and Sacred Symbolism, Symbolism of Christianity's Holy Buildings and you will receive this because it's a brand new um, print run that we've commissioned you'll receive your free copy in um, August and um, they are being printed at the moment um, and finally just to add to this um, I know there were a lot of um, comments and questions asking if Richard would come back and do um, some more lectures. Um, I'm really happy to announce that. Um, I had a chat with him yesterday and he's agreed to do a couple more. So um, keep your eye on our Facebook page um, as there'll be details of those lectures coming up shortly. Now, next week, um, we are going to be joined by um, Natalie Cohen, who is the Cathedral Archaeologist at Canterbury Cathedral, as well as being the Regional Archaeologist for the National Church, uh, sorry, the National Trust. Um, now we're going to be looking at um, parish churches, priories and palaces, the archaeologies of religion and ritual. So if you want to learn more about that lecture, do go on our website or check out our Facebook events page. But um, once again, everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you, um, Professor Saul, for taking the time and for a wonderful, wonderful lecture. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Bye.